Matt has built the world-class platform to help companies make sure that their messages and communications are reliably getting to the inboxes of their customers. Please welcome Matt Blumberg. <laughs> Matt asked me before um, he came on, what are we gonna talk about tonight? And I said, I don't know, <laughs> because I actually never write any questions or plan anything. And I think that's what kind of makes it fun and interesting is this is kind of our organic conversation. We just have you know, a bunch of people that are here listening in. So we tend to talk about a bit about your experience, what you think about the trends going on, um, and then everyone here will get a chance to ask you some questions. Sounds good. Yeah. So um, you're actually from SoCal, right? You grew up in San Diego. I am. I'm, uh, I love coming back home. Uh, every time I get off the plane, whether it's San Diego here or San Francisco, it's, uh, I, I'm reminded that I was supposed to come back here at some point. So. And now you're based in New York. Yeah. All right. So let's, let's give everybody a quick, um, quick snippet about Return Pass. So uh, in an actual better founder's words, tell everybody what Reper Return Path is and what it does to help you know, folks, the folks here. Yeah, so we're, uh, we describe ourselves as uh, uh, the uh, leading company in the email intelligence space. We're really kind of a data and, and analytics platform. Uh, we don't deliver email, uh, which is when people think about email marketing, that's the first thing they think, like, oh, I got, I got to send out 38 million emails. Uh, so we're not a marketing automation solution or uh, you know, or an email service provider. Um, we plug into any of those sending engines and we work with uh, marketers uh, and publishers and social media companies of any size uh, to make sure they're optimizing their programs. Uh, so we help them uh, measure their programs uh, and understand in you know, the same way they'd use an Omniture or Google Analytics to figure out what's going on on their website. They use our mm -hmm. dashboard to figure out what's going on with their email program. Uh, we uh, certify their email so that ISPs know to trust it, uh, and they don't. And just so everyone knows, well, what's an example of an ISP? Uh, Hotmail, uh, Yahoo, Gmail. Got it. Uh, uh, so we certify mail to make sure that uh, it doesn't get filtered by mistake. Uh, we uh, protect brands and their customers from phishing and spoofing, which is kind of public what's enemy spoofing? number one. Spoofing is the <laughs> spoofing and phishing kind of go together. So spoofing is. The bad guy pretends that he's Doc Stock. Uh, Fishing yes. is he goes yes. after your customers. It's always strange. I always I always wonder how I get an email from myself. Yeah, right? that's, that's like, how is Jason at Doc Stock sending me a communication that I did not send? Right. So that is uh, that seems kind of fucked up. There's a goofy. It is, and there's <laughs> there's a goofy term for that, uh, which is backscatter. Backscatter. If, if you want to impress someone at a cocktail party. It sounds so. like the name of a boy band. Yeah. <laughs> All right, backscattering. Uh, so anyway, so that's that's. You're at some pretty geeky cocktail parties, by the way. You're like, well, hey, yeah. if you want to impress somebody at a cocktail party, <laughs> just drop backscattering, and you'll be the life of the party, Jason. If, you know, 14 years in the email business. What do you yeah. want? So uh, anyway, so that's that's uh, that's a little bit about how we work with uh, with uh, with brands and companies to sort of op optimize email. Email is still, you know. Far and away, the number one digital communication channel. For yeah, so we'll talk, talk about that, customers. right? Everyone yeah, talks about absolutely. social, 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 but email's the quiet, unappreciated workhorse yes. of the whole thing. So, um, how other, many folks are in the company today? Uh, we're just under 400 now. Wow! Congratulations. Thanks. And and how many years have you been doing this for? We uh, started in uh, late '99, so we're just about to have our 14th uh, anniversary, and. Uh, as I tell people, God, you know, we started this business last century. <laughs> and how, how much money have you raised along the way? Um, believe it or not, I don't actually have a good, precise answer for that, because at this point in the company's life, we've raised a lot of secondary uh, yeah. to replace some of the earlier investors. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but it's in the neighborhood of 50 million. Got it. Over a long period of time and lots of iterations of the business. So let's, let me just give you a sense of everybody here. Uh, how many folks are currently running or plan to start uh, running their own company in the next six months? And how many people are currently uh, actively trying to fundraise? So you get a sense of the startup audience that's here tonight, yep. what everybody's doing. Uh, why, what was the impetus for you to be part of this team to help start this company? How did that all come about? So. Uh, I mean, it's literally so long ago now, it's, it, it, and it, it's not even the business we're in anymore, but the, uh, we've always done stuff around email. And the, um, the original idea we had was, uh, if, you go, if you wind the clock back to, to 99, e email was still 
uh, pretty early uh, days in terms of its adoption and uh, the amount of services that were available around it. Um, and um, I had been in the, in the mid-90s, I had worked at a, a company called Movie Phone, uh, mm -hmm. which people in LA probably know, 777 okay. Film back in the old days. Hello. And, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Welcome to Movie Phone. <laughs> uh, so I ran the internet business for Movie Phone uh, starting in 95. And um, one of the was things- Was that your first four way, foray in, I mean, probably anybody's at that time. Yeah, that, we, was, we, we launched the, one of the first you know, 100 major commercial What were you doing before that? Uh, before that, I actually worked in VC for a couple of years, and before that, I was a strategy consultant. And, and how did you get into venture capital? I know some people here would say, hey, I would love to be a venture capitalist without, before you made a, a boatload of money and yeah, you know, served up 10 trillion emails a month. It's, uh, it's, it's a hard business to get into because it's, it's small, and there are not a lot of, uh, not a lot of junior people in it. And, uh, um, but there are a few, and uh, you know, I happened to sort of fall into one of the few openings there was for an associate. Yeah. Oh, was that back Long east or here on the west yeah. coast? Yeah, that was the east coast. Got it. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I did uh, four and a half, five years at Movie Phone before we got acquired by AOL, ran the internet business there. And one of the things that we did uh, is we built one of the first uh, commercial email applications, which was this thing called Movie Mail, um, which still sort of exists, although AOL has kind of tortured it uh, nine ways from, from Sunday. So it's unrecognizable. But, uh, but we built this thing in probably 96, and it was before... Uh, there was really any commercial technology around email. So if you wanted to send out emails, you just you know used a, a, a Q mail or Postfix or something and set up a box and just sent sent your own emails out. And um, one of the things that we recognized when we did that <clears throat> that we had a really good asset. Uh, we we turned on the service. We uh, you know got up to a million subscribers really quickly, and uh, we knew that. Uh, that there were some things that were kind of creaky about email. So every time we sent out a message, we got a whole bunch of bounces from ISPs, and we didn't really know what to do with them. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so we, set, we started the company around the premise that- uh, Who started the company with you? So uh, it was more or less just me. I mean, I had a couple of people that were early on uh, with it. Um, but the- uh, Talk yeah. about that for a sec. So your whole, how old are you right now? At, at that point, how old are you? At that point, I'm yeah. 28, 29. And so what, what kind of gave you the confidence to jump out and to do your own thing kind of at that point in your career? So I had been fortunate enough to, to essentially run an internet startup inside of another company. Mm -hmm. um, so Movie Phone was actually started in the 80s. It was the, just the telephone service. They hired me to build an internet business. So I had kind of done the, the startup GM thing, but with, you know, without having to raise money and actually run a, a company. Mm -hmm. So I had you know, reasonably good training for it. At least I thought I had reasonably good training for it until I actually started doing it. And then where, where did you get the, where did you get the capital? Like when you very first started the company, did you self-finance that? Did you raise money right off the bat? Yeah, so, uh, you know, we self-financed for a couple months, but, uh, but then we raised an angel round. And, you know, n 1999 was such a very different time and, and place than today. Uh, so first of all, it was more expensive to start a company. Um, and second, there were, uh, uh, it was just a different mentality uh, around around the internet, and you know people were throwing money at us. So mm -hmm. we went out to do an angel round, and um, uh, we said, "Well, you know, let's try to let's try to raise five hundred thousand bucks." And we ended up raising two and a half million from friends and family, and friends and families, friends and family, and we probably could have raised five million. And so this is, remember, late 99, early 2000, this is before any mm -hmm. of, the, of the badness happened with the internet economy the first time around. Uh, and it was nuts. I mean, we would go take meetings with people. Uh, the ask was 25,000. And they would say, well, I'll invest, but only if I can invest 100, and only if my brother Jim can invest 100. <laughs> Like, who's Jim? <laughs> it doesn't matter who Jim is. So, uh, so that, that's how we got started. I don't think it works like that anymore. <laughs> and I don't think it ever should have worked like that. I, 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 as history has told us. So you raised $2.5 million. You're off to the races. Did you kind of fall prey to you know, spending too loose and fast, or were you careful with that money? No, we were pretty careful with it. Um, you know, by the, and, and I think we would have been anyway, but by the time we really got going, that, the markets were starting to slide a little bit. So, uh, but I do have this very, uh, this very vivid memory of, um, so we, we raised that money in late 99 or maybe January of 2000, 
And then we actually got a, a VC round done in October of 2000, right before the market really fell apart, like the week before the market fell apart. Uh, and I remember after we did that round, uh, so the market had already fallen apart, and we're in the first board meeting with the new investor, uh, and you know, real VC, and, uh, and he looks at me and he says, yeah, and we, we raised seven million bucks or something like that, and he says, yeah, you know, you really shouldn't get your burn rate of much over a million a month, maybe a million and a half. <laughs> So, sign of the times. Yes. yes. We, and we, so we didn't. We were reasonably conservative. And, and it was good. I mean, it was very hard to build a business in 2000, 2001, 2002. Yeah, what, was the business, what was the business day one? What was the first incarnation of the business? So the first incarnation of the business was a change of address service and a, uh, for consumers, and then a data processing service for businesses. So um, you know, if you think about your list of 38 million, some number of those people are going to change their email address. Uh, every year because they decide that they don't want Yahoo anymore and they go to yeah. Gmail or they switch jobs and they're using a, a professional address or something like that. Uh, and um, uh, most of them are not going to come back and tell you. So we created this kind of free portal for people. It sort of mirrored the way the post office handles change of address. Hey, come in, fill out the green card. Mm -hmm. uh, we forward your mail for free. And, um, and then we would go to companies like, like DocStock and say, hey, if you give us all your bounces, uh, we'll see which ones we can match up to a new forwarding address and reconnect you with your customer. So that was the, the initial idea. That business uh, never got big. I mean, it got to two or three million in revenue and, and uh, it led us to our current business. So we've kind of always been in and around email. What, when did the company, so over the 14 year history, when did it really start to kind of take off? What year did it really start to hit? Um, so, uh, it, so twice uh, that happened. So we started with this one product. Uh, it did okay, it didn't do great. We, uh, added a whole bunch of other products, and then the business took off. So we went from uh, 2 million in revenue to 30 million in revenue between 2000, uh, 2001 and 2007. And then uh, in 2008, we actually uh, realized that we were doing too many things. So we had a whole bunch of products, uh, and a few of them were working, but they were starting to move in different directions, and it was way too much for us to manage out of a still relatively small company. Mm -hmm. So we um, did what I th think of now, looking in the review mirror, is a pretty extraordinary thing. We actually uh, got rid of a whole bunch of the business. So we shrunk the company from 30 million in revenue to 12 million in revenue. Wow. Uh, and sold off a couple of product lines um, and got it down to what it is today. Uh, and then so from that $12 million base in 2008, We've grown really quickly since then to about se about seventy million. Today. Did you go from thirty million to twelve million by l selling the assets or just stopping uh, the business? Most of them selling. So the investors weren't. Were, I mean, how did the investors take the strategy to say, "Hey, all this revenue we have, it's not going to be here tomorrow, but we'll have cash in the bank for the assets." Yeah, it, and it actually wasn't a tremendous amount of cash in the bank. In fact, in fact, uh, selling is probably a little generous of a term. <laughs> uh, uh, we we. Um, got them off of our hands. Uh, and uh, actually, the, most of it we, uh, we spun out into a separate company and gave to our shareholders, but we had to finance it. But was that revenue that wasn't profitable? Was that why it was easy to make that decision? Yeah, it, it was just different. Um, you know, we ended up uh, with a bunch of businesses that were around email, but one of them was a market research business, and one of them was a lead gen business, and then there was the current business. So they really had very different dynamics. Um, so, uh, so we, we sold them, but we didn't end up with a bunch of cash on the balance sheet, but it was, uh, it was a pretty uh, easy, relatively straightforward decision for us to make as a management team and a board because we had one business that was clearly um, not only doing very well, but starved for mm -hmm. resources and, uh, and starved for focus. Got it. So since then, the business has grown from 12 million to 70 million. That's really impressive. So there's been a good, you know, sort of two waves of, of growth with this weird dip in the middle. And, and is the path for, is, is the mindset to take the company public or just keep building the business and see what happens? Um, well, so it, yes and yes. Um, so it's, we're heads down and we're very focused on the task at hand and building the business and we've got some interesting things in the works for it. Um, you can't uh, wake up one morning and decide that you'd like to be public and go public the next day. So we're working on uh, lining ourselves up to do that if we want to do that, but we don't have a hard date by which we yeah. feel like we need to do that. And, it, you know, it's so, it, it sometimes feels like, you know, you know, people staying a year or two at a business is their limit. You're in this 14 years now. 
Where do you get your energy? Where do you get your passion? Where do you get your excitement to keep growing and reinventing this business? Um, so part of the answer uh, lies in your question. Um, we keep reinventing it. And so it's been 14 years. My business card says the same thing it said 14 years ago, but it hasn't been 14 years at the same job. Uh, the business has changed and the business has grown. And mm -hmm. so every couple of years it actually feels like I'm, I'm doing something else. But really I think our, um, our passion as a company is around two things. One is, uh, is being super innovative to solve uh, some critical problems in the way um, kind of the, the infrastructure of email works because it is such a powerful communication channel. Um, and then the other thing that really drives us is, uh, is building a great company. And uh, we've won you know, all kinds of awards that we're really, really proud of around employer of choice. Um, and we not only think that that's good for business, right, because you get the best people and you, uh, and you retain them, uh, but it just makes life a lot better. Uh, yeah. So we're, we're equally passionate about building the business and building the company. Yeah. All right, so I'm kind of curious about this book. Um, so you're running this company, it's got 400 people in it and does 70 million in revenue. A, when, why the heck did I write a When book? do you find time to buy, write a book and why did you take time to write this book? What was, what was the point? I'm, I'm guessing you're not becoming a multi millionaire off of this, at no. least odds why, right? No. So I mean, if, I, if we convince everybody here to buy 100 <laughs> copies, that's not bad for you, right? Uh, at the moment, we're still working down the advance, so, <laughs> okay. uh, uh, which, which went to a, a writer, editor guy to help me with it. So. Uh, so no, I'm not. Uh, this is the nonprofit arm of the Blumberg family. Um, and, I'm sure uh, your wife loved that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure she was super ecstatic about you spending all those hours. Yeah, exactly. So well, so here's how it came about. It was it was uh, a little accidental. So I've been blogging for almost 10 years now, um, and I write a blog about being an entrepreneur. Occasionally, I sneak something in about the about the email business or something. Let's talk, let's, let's let, me, let me divert there for yeah. a little bit. So again, show of hands, how many folks are running their own companies here? Right. At why, at, and, and I, I've done this for a couple of years, I've done this since we started DocStock, but um, what's the value to chronicling and talking about and blogging about your entrepreneurial experience? Like literally, what, is, what has it done for you and how do you justify that cost versus putting that same time in your business? So it is time spent in the business. Uh, and uh, you know, I'd say two things. One is, uh, I, I actually think blogging is inherently somewhat selfish or, or Narcissistic might be a little too strong, but let's say it's inherently selfish, so I get a lot out of it. So when I write a blog post, and mine are pretty short, I don't write a ton of them, uh, but when I write three paragraphs, so I pick a topic and I write three paragraphs about something, um, I uh, force myself to crystallize my thinking about that subject, and I come away from it smarter. Even though it was my input to it, mm -hmm. um, the output makes me smarter. And how, and how often, do you, how, how often uh, historically have you been blogging? About once a week. Okay. So I don't do, I, I'm, not, I'm not writing five posts a day. So yeah. it's about once a week. But, that, um, but over a, that period of time, and that's a serious commitment. You're talking it's, about hundreds and hundreds yeah, of posts. Yeah, it's, uh, I think it's, it's like 800 posts now. So one and a half times a week, I guess. And, and where do you, you kind of get the inspiration for the posts that you want to talk about? Uh, you know, usually it's just stuff that's happening at work that, uh, uh, you know, it probably took me a year or two to get into a good rhythm about it. But, uh, you know, once you have that lens, you sort of see everything through that lens. And, yeah. um, so, but there's another really valuable thing that I get out of blogging besides sort of my own thought process, which is uh, it's a good way of communicating to the company. Mm -hmm. um, it's probably a good way of communicating to the outside world as well, but, but it is a good way of communicating to the company. And one of my um, uh, sort of director level person in the organization told me once that he thought that reading my blog was like getting a peek inside my head. Uh, and uh, which is a little weird, but um, uh, but it's probably better peek inside your head than your bedroom window, though. Uh, probably, yeah. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so uh, so anyway, that's uh, so the, the the book, the idea that I had. Well, re real quick, yeah. we'll get to the book. Okay. What's uh, one or two of your your famous or most popular blog posts? So what's your blog, by the way? Uh, the blog is called Only Once, and the URL is onlyonceblog.com. Got it. And that came from uh, that name came from a blog post that one of my board members and investors, uh, Fred Wilson, put up in 2003 or 2004, and he wrote this blog post that said, "You're only a first-time CEO once." And uh, so when I started a blog, which was a couple months later, uh, I called it Only Once after that, and I said, "Oh, you know, I'm yeah. a first-time CEO now." Only once Still, for 14 years. Only once for 14 <laughs> years, right. Uh, so, uh, um, so 
the most famous blog post. Yeah, what, well, one of I'll your favorite or most famous? Uh, I'll, I'll tell you two that I put up in the last few weeks that have gotten a huge amount of, um, of pass around and chatter. So uh, one of them was called How to Quit Your Job. Mm. And another one uh, was about Lean In. And they've both gotten, uh, both internally at Return Path and externally, a significant amount of So what was, what was your point of view on how to quit your job? It doesn't so, seem like, it, it seems like if you're going to communicate something to your employees, that may it not wouldn't be, be the that. top. <laughs> Actually, the, so, so, uh, so it's the opposite. How to call so. your boss named Matt a douchebag. <laughs> <laughs> that seems pretty self-explanatory. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just replace Matt with Jason. Yeah. Uh, so actually, you know, that post um, was, uh, I reprinted an email that I sent to the company with that same subject line. So it wasn't, uh, actually I was using the blog to communicate that. I had communicated mm -hmm. it to the company. And, um, and I put it up on the web, not because it was uh, general advice to people for how to quit their jobs, because every company's culture is different and you know, what works in one place doesn't necessarily work in another. Um, but uh, a lot of people internally encouraged me to put it up. They said, you know, this is really interesting. It's one of the unique things about did Return somebody Path, quit so. the, Did somebody quit or had people quit in really bad ways? Uh, yes, and at the same time, someone quit in a really, really good way. So, what so. what is the way to quit your? Well, all right, what's the way not to quit your job to start, and what's the way to quit your job? Well, the way never to quit your job, I think, no matter where you work, is to burn the bridge, right? To call your boss a douchebag and you know light the place on fire and yeah. walk out. And um, although it could feel really good, it could feel really, it could really good. feel really, it could really, feel, really nice. It, and I have had moments in my career not in my current job where I really felt like doing that. Yeah. But I don't think you get much out of that at the end of the day. Um, and you know, our reputation as humans follows us around quite mm -hmm. a bit. So, um, so I'm not a, I'm not a big, big fan of that. Um, in terms of how to quit your job, the, the thing that I was talking about was that um, you know, we have, a, um, we have a, like a social contract at Return Path around your employment and we are really good at giving people ample notice if they're not doing well yeah. and ample help and performance plans and benefit of the doubt um, and uh, you know our one of our mantras is no one should ever be surprised to be fired mm -hmm. like if it's not going well th they'll know that for a long time and the flip side of that is we ask people that if they're unhappy they've got to tell the company um, and there's no there's never gonna be any retribution for saying hey I'm unhappy I think I might want to do something else um, one of two things comes out of that conversation. Either the company learns something and we fix your situation, mm -hmm. um, or uh, we agree that it's not working and everyone's got a lot more notice to do an orderly transition. Got it. So that was sort of the, the point of that post. Got it. And then lean in. What was the uh, other than um, was it the male version of Sheryl Sandberg's? <laughs> well, it was so it was a post. I, the, the f I put two of them up. The first one was in June, whenever I read the book. Um, and uh, so it was a post about the book. And uh, I, uh, you know, it's funny, I wasn't, I wasn't going to read it, not because I had a problem with it, I just wasn't, wasn't on my list. And a group of women at the company challenged me to read it and do book group with them. So I said, okay. What did you, what did you do in the book Give group? that a try. Um, you talked about the book? We channeled Oprah. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, no, we, you know, we talked about the book and, and you know, what each of us uh, cool. sort of took away from it. And um, it was maybe another one or two guys on the phone. It was probably you know, 15 of us total. It was sort of one team that, that was reading it. It was a team that was heavily female uh, and, uh, and invited me to join it. So I wrote this post with some of my takeaways from the book. And it's a very, very good book. Uh, and not, uh, I liked it a lot more than I expected to, and I got a lot more out of it than I expected to. And so I put this post up uh, with some of my thoughts coming out of it, and uh, got a huge amount of, um, of positive feedback from the organization, and then got an email the next morning from Sheryl Sandberg. Oh, that's um, cool. So she's got you know, a good Google keyword feed set up, or publicist, or whatever, but it was an actual email from her. And, and um, there's a trademark infringement for your blog post title. <laughs> Take down that yeah. blog post title, so, or else the full weight and credit of Facebook shall rain <laughs> upon you. Uh, that was a good, we had a good back and That's forth. That's the email I got it. from her, I'm yeah, sorry, was, excuse me. <laughs> yeah, we had a good back and forth. And look, her, the whole point of her book was that uh, the issues that women face in the workplace aren't going to get better unless people actually start talking about them and talking about them rationally. Um, as opposed to just bringing their baggage and dumping it in the middle of the floor. Um, and that was sort of the point of my post was, all right, 
I'm talking about it, and I'm a male leader. And so she sent me a really thoughtful email about, you know, hey, this is exactly the kind of thing I was hoping to, uh, to inspire. So uh, one of the things I kind of committed to in the blog post to the company was uh, that uh, I was, uh, she quoted some stats in the book about how uh, women are paid so much less than men for doing the same job, which I just, wanted, I just find appalling. And, um, you know, I thought about that and I said, well, God, I hope we don't do that. I know we don't do that for people who report to me because I pay attention to that and look at the numbers, but I don't know if there's any unconscious bias that's kind of found its way into mm -hmm. the system over the years and we've got enough people now that I, I don't necessarily look at everyone's comp. So I committed in the post to the company that I was going to study that and come back to everyone with the results. So we, we did some work on it, and the good news is we don't have an issue like that um, systemically, which I was happy to see. Uh, so I put up another post just last week, so a few months between the two, um, saying that, hey, we, you know, we found that out, and that was good news, but we found out some other things, and we got some work to do, and I put some specifics up. Um, and then um, I sent it around to the company, and uh, I said, you know, I want to create a... Um, I want to create a little bit of a task force called the um, Women in the Workplace group and uh, would love to make sure, look, I think we do stuff better than most companies, but, I, but that doesn't mean we can't do them better and I'd love to have a couple volunteers to you know, do a round table with me over the course of a few months and think about this. So I sent that to the company figuring, hey, you know, we're pretty busy, we've got a lot of things going on and maybe I'll get 10 or 15 volunteers. And I got 85 wow. uh, within two hours. Uh, so now I got to figure out how to have a round table with 85 people. <laughs> uh, but you know, so power of blogging, right? That's mobilized a huge segment of my employee population. Sure. So what, I mean, um, talk a little bit about the book. What was, what's the kind of main takeaway for someone from when, when they read the book? So the point of the book, um, which I think I write in the introduction is, um, uh, there's no instruction manual anywhere for how to be a CEO. And you know, when Jeff Immelt became CEO of GE, he had had 20 years of grooming for the job. And he had been effectively the CEO of a multi-billion dollar company within GE. Uh, but you know, most people who start companies today don't have anything close to that level of training and grooming. And that is true if you're 19 in a dorm room, but it's also true if you're 28 or 29 like I was. Like I had a little bit of training, uh, but, but nothing close to what I needed. And uh, so this is the book that I wish someone had given me on my, for, on my first day at work. All right, so you're the CEO coach for the folks in here that are starting companies. Uh, what are the couple top critical pieces of advice that kind of ubiquitously go across everyone? Um, so I think no matter what kind of business you have, you need to be great at telling stories. And why? Uh, because that's how you engage people. That's how you engage their um, their passion and their creative instincts. And uh, you're just constantly telling the story of your business, whether you're recruiting an employee, mm -hmm. uh, raising money, uh, selling to a customer. Uh, it's all about telling a story. And it's not, you know, 20 years ago, it might have been about doing a good PowerPoint deck, uh, but that's not it anymore. Now it's, it's really about telling a story. And businesses have stories, right? They have a protagonist the customer. Mm -hmm. uh, they have a beginning, a middle, an ending. Um, you know, there it, it is a story, and you have to get good at, at telling it that way. And and how how do, how does someone get good at telling the story of their business? Sorry. How, how how can somebody get better at telling the story of their business? Well, I think the the way to get better at it is um, uh, is to practice it. And what I mean by that isn't like oh, stand in front of a mirror with a script and practice it. Um, but uh, you know, if you if you view yourself as having sort of three main stakeholders, you know, customers, investors, and employees, um, there's a version of the story that you need to write for each one. So it's the same basic story, uh, but you know, one of them you're asking for money, mm -hmm. uh, one of them you're asking for their life, uh, and one of them you're asking to you know participate in your service or your solution one way or another, and. They're just different, you know, they're different versions of the same story. So you just gotta, you gotta keep practicing it and you gotta keep trying new things out every time you do it to see, you know, what resonates okay. better than the last thing. So learn how to tell your story, what else? Um, there's a lot in the book about um, what I would call self-management. So I think the, there's such a huge amount of work that's required to manage and lead um, an organization, even if you only have five people working for you. Because uh, those are five people that walk in every morning and they're looking at you, right? You're the boss. Um, and 
I think being good at management of others starts with being good at management of yourself. Um, if, you, if you don't have your shit together, you just have a really hard time What's making an other people What's an example of so, being good at managing yourself? <clears throat> so, like your own time management? Yeah, so time management is, is a pretty important part of it. Um, the, uh, I would say another thing is, is, uh, is, t is task management, which may be a little different than time management. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, every, everyone should have. How, how do you manage your tasks? Do you have a sheet of paper? Do you use <clears throat> Outlook? Do you have an app? What do, what do you personally do to manage all the things that you've got to do? Yeah, so I have, uh, I have everything in a spreadsheet. Um, I, uh, and I now have it in, uh, uh, online, so I can access it from anywhere. I've tried some of the apps. The apps are fine. I mean, it, it, it's how, less about the- How many things in your the, spreadsheet do you have at any given time? Yeah, it's, so it's less about the mechanism and more about actually having it, committing yeah. to it, keeping it current, and having everything in one place. So I, the place that I see people fall down is when they start one of those and it ends up being one of many places got where it. they list things and then they've got post-its on the wall and then they keep their personal stuff somewhere else. But you know the reality is you're only one person, you've got one brain. So funnel everything into the same thing no how, matter what it is. How far out do you plan your longer tasks? Like someone, once, someone showed me once just a very simple T that I still use. So it's, you know, I'll, I'll come in on a Monday and I'll just draw a T on a sheet of paper and, and a book I use and I'll put weekly and I'll put tasks. And tasks are the things that I'm going to just try to knock mm -hmm. off that day and weekly is the things that over the course of the week I know I need to get done. H how do you manage things that aren't immediately present but you know, are, need to get done over the course of the next couple of days or the next couple of weeks? Um, so actually my, my sheet is less about stuff that has to get done today um, and more about everything that has to get done over the next handful of weeks. And everything's just got a date and the date field is color coded by whether it's today or in the next week or further out. Got it. Um, what are the but big? So, but that's one thing about self-management. There thing are, about you know, self lots, lots of things, right? Yeah. D exercising, really important, right? Most, uh, and and you know, I'm not the first person to discover that in life, right? But um, the number of entrepreneurs that I meet who uh, who are just tired, and because they're working a million hours, and uh, they kind of get out of shape and they're eating bad food all the time, and um, and you say, well, when was the last time you went to a gym? Oh, I can't possibly have time to go to the gym. I'm working so hard. Um, you know, for me, it comes down to math, right? So there are, uh, there are only so many hours in the week. Um, you spend two or three of them exercising. Not that many hours, right? 120 mm -hmm. minutes, 180 minutes. Um, in order to get a payback on that across a 50 or 60 hour work week, you need to be 5% more productive at work. So who, who can honestly say if they're exercising regularly a couple hours a week that they're not 5% or probably more like 10 or 20% more productive at work? Mm -hmm. um, but it's one of those things that's kind of easy to fall off. Yeah. Well, probably like if your job is, you know, they, they uh, monitor you as you sleep as a test guinea, then you're, then you're maybe perhaps being less productive. Right. But that's, that's an outlier. That's a that's weird case. That's an outlier. Uh, what, are, what, are some of the, what are some of the big mistakes that you see entrepreneurs making? What are the what are the big what are the mistakes that the folks in this room are making that they may not even realize they're making? Uh, a big one, a big one I see entrepreneurs make all the time is they fall in love with their own product, mm -hmm. and um, or they build a product for themselves because they think they're the typical customer. Um, if you're an entrepreneur, you're not the typical customer of almost anything, um, and uh, you know you you want to. You, have, you really have to listen to the market and listen to customers. And you, know, you, you do have to be stubborn to be an entrepreneur because a lot of people will say no and you gotta persevere through it. But when everyone says no, uh, at some point you gotta listen to it. So I think that's one, one pretty important thing. Another place I see a lot of entrepreneurs fall down is actually around cash management. And this is true of, of uh, you know, tech VC backed companies. It's also true of, of kind of more true small businesses. And, the, uh, uh, you know, the, the reality is it takes a while to develop some instincts around managing money by the tens or hundreds of thousands or millions um, as opposed to managing your own bank account. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there, you know, a lot of companies run into trouble because they think they have enough money to do X and then it turns out they really don't understand the dynamics of a cash flow statement and a balance sheet and, mm -hmm. uh, and they find themselves pinched. Got it. What was, so in, in the 14 year arc, what was the toughest challenge that you guys faced? Was, was there ever a time that there were, the business was actually in jeopardy of going under? Was that a real? Oh yeah, no, I'd, I'd say 
regularly, we've cheated death, you know, five times over. What What was the biggest cheat? What was the biggest time that you just thought, "Wow, I, I really, we just really brought this company back from the brink of imploding." Um, you know, it was probably in the reasonably early days. So, you know, we had to do a couple rounds of layoffs in 2000, 2001, 2002, which were just horrible. And um, uh, you know, we started the business close enough to the, to the internet bust that we never even really got the business up and running until after that. And it was really, we really struggled for the first couple of years because all the companies that were in dot-com 1.0 were gone, and that, that, that was going to be our customer base. Um, and we, uh, you know, I think we, we just came in every day feeling like, yeah, this may, this may not work for a long time. Okay. How, would you, how would you describe, oops, before we get to that, was there any other, what, was that the biggest challenge you faced in the business, or was, what would you describe as the single biggest challenge in 14 years running this company that you've ever faced professionally? We've had, I don't know if it's the single biggest one, but we've had two very nasty pieces of litigation against us uh, around patents. And uh, they're just horrible. They're horrible, they're expensive, they're soul sucking. How, I mean, is there any way to prepare for that? I mean, you're, you know, you're starting off, you're building your business, you're thinking, I'm gonna go out, I'm gonna get customers. Is there any way really to protect against just you know, someone coming out of the blue and, and giving you a suit? No. I mean, you can... So that sucks. You know, this is one of, the, one of the things in your book that I really liked. You talked about IP uh, and had a chapter about, hey, you know, here's how you think about it and file some patents. And you can, you can file your own patents and you can try to search for everything that's out there. Uh, but the reality is you can't necessarily find everything that's out there, certainly things that are pending. And, uh, uh, and you never know when someone who has a patent that isn't relevant is going to decide to sue you anyway. So there's a limited amount of control you have over inbound. Did you ever end up going on the investing side? Have you done angel investments over the years in other tech mm -hmm. companies? I have. What, what do you look for? So you saw that there were a group of people that raised their hand. Yep. Um, what do you look for when you go to invest in a company? And what are the qualities that you look for an entrepreneur that being in the fact, being the case that you're still here in the arena, you know, attacking it every day? So, uh, so I've stopped doing them. I, I did them. I did a bunch of them for a while. And decided that it's a really difficult way to make money unless you are doing a lot of it, and unless you're willing to back up every single one of them with four more investments in subsequent rounds. Um, and uh, it just, that just wasn't working for me for a variety of reasons. But when, um, when I did that, or when I mentor other startups, or you know, get involved with tech stars or things like that, um, you know, the, the things that, that I love to see are uh, obviously passion for the subject matter, whether there's deep expertise or not, I care less about, but real passion about, uh, about what they're doing. Um, a real coherent theory about how to build a business around it, mm -hmm. which sort of comes back to my point about storytelling. Like they actually have to be able to articulate uh, not just how they're gonna build something cool, but how they're gonna make money off of it. Um, and uh, you know, ultimately an entrepreneur uh, can't work alone, so they gotta be able to attract mm -hmm. A team and and uh, you know be able to work with other people. Yeah. So uh, I'd love to get your thoughts on kind of some of the current trends. You know, I, I feel like there's some similarities. Both grew up SoCal, probably similar like parents background. Both in you know non sexy businesses, email delivery, helping small businesses. Uh, seven years into it, 14 years into it. Uh, today, I don't know if that everyone saw uh, Pinterest raised I think 230 million dollars at a. $2.3 billion valuation, right? And this is a product that, at least to my knowledge, uh, still is making hardly any, if any, revenue whatsoever. So you good live for, Good through, for Pinterest. Good for Pinterest, great, right. yeah. I mean, all, all, the, all the success in the world, and obviously an absolutely incredible product. But you, you, you have this unique advantage of, you know, you ran a business and you saw that whole first cycle, what do you make of valuations like that for companies that still don't make any money? And do you think it's a rational expectation of what their future cash flows really will be? Or do you think there's this irrational exuberance of, hey, my brother Jim wants to invest $100,000? 
Yeah. Uh, so I think that things are more rational now than they were uh, before the 2000 crash and even before um, the, uh, the 2008 crash. And it doesn't mean that Pinterest is going to be a huge and profitable company someday, although I hope they are. Um, but uh, um, I think the difference is there are fewer companies that attract that level of, of frenzy now. And the ones that do uh, have something there. And they've so built a direct 2000, audience. 2006, you know, everyone was getting massive mm -hmm. valuations for anything that had eyeballs because, of course, someday you'd figure out how to monetize it. And that doesn't happen in quite, quite the same way now. Um, so, uh, you know, if you look at Twitter as a good example, right? Uh, three, four years ago, when my friend Dick became CEO there, I don't think they had any revenue. And, and people were making fun of Twitter all over the place. That's not a business. 140 characters is, mm -hmm. is silly. I mean, you look at their filing now, right? They're you know billion dollar company. So uh, there you know there weren't ten things funded like that. There was one thing funded mm -hmm. like that, or or maybe a second one. So I think the world has gotten a little more rational. Got it. What are what are some of the what are some of the apps and products that you found have embedded themselves into your daily life that you just absolutely love? That is an interesting question. Like what, what app, pull out your, you have an iPhone? I do. Pull out your iPhone for a sec. <laughs> and if Tinder's on there, I won't tell anybody. Don't worry about it. Um, what, are, what, are, what are some of the apps that you've got? I mean, what, what are you using? Like what's part of your daily life? Uh, well, number one, of course, is email. Well, come on. I mean, obviously, yes. I'm saying what, what? <laughs> that's a given that the, no, the master so, uh, of email delivery uses email. There we go. I so, didn't doubt that. Uh, so here we go. Starbucks, love the e-payment, and uh, automatically refills the credit card, and every tenth one's free. That's but cool. only if you're using this, right? Okay. Uh, one password, so all my devices store secure passwords on them. Uh, American Airlines, critical mm -hmm. app. Actually, there's a, here's a great, uh, uh, great uh, app that I use because I do a lot of international travel called iTranslate that uh, not only will it translate what you need, but it'll actually speak it for you. Oh, so you get into a cab nice. in Brazil and tell them where you're going and just hold the phone up. And I could use that in my office. <laughs> 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 Look at the Israelis there. <laughs> Milan. Um, where, do, where do you see, where do you, I mean, what are some of the trends going forward that you're most excited about? It's kind about? of a lame answer. I'm looking for something better. Oh, you can give us something better if you got it. Yeah. There's a guitar tuning app. Guitar cool. tuning app. Yeah, if you play guitar, right? And you don't have a piano or a tuning fork around. I was, I was hoping for something much more salacious than that. But <laughs> guitar tuning is super exciting it as well. It is super exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Where, where, what are some of the trends and businesses that you're most excited about? I mean, what, what's a, a new company that got launched in the last you know, year? Or, or what's a category that you just think, hey, there is a massive potential here? Uh, or maybe otherwise said, if you were going to go start any other business, what kind of business would you look to start? Um, you know, I think the, the um, kind of marketing big data space is very interesting. It's also very confusing and very crowded, but um, the, the, the internet is spawning uh, data orders of magnitude above the volumes that were in existence a year or two ago. And um, all of our clients who, you know, who are marketers or publishers are just drowning in it. And they, they, don't, they don't even have enough storage for it, let alone the analytics capacity to figure out mm -hmm. how to make sense of it. Um, so, you know, there's there's some there's a bunch of things going on in that space. Like I said, it's it's confusing, but I think there's uh, the ability to turn all these streams of data into actionable insights to drive businesses is going to be really important over the next few years. And it'll be the difference between the companies that are successful and the companies that aren't. So I, I'm super actually interested to talk to you, to get your point of view on the future of email. I mean, email seems like something that on the one hand, it is so if you look at the one thing that we all spend the most time with, interacting with a day professionally, it, it's still by far email. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure there's some there's some folks that spend more time on Facebook or some social, but 
e email, you know, for me at least, my Outlook just lives open on my screen all yep. day long. Um, and yet on the same hand, I think if you, we were to poll, you know, if just quick poll, how many of you think to some degree email is broken and has a chance to be better, right? That just overall email in general could be better, right? How many of you right now are emailing so you're not paying attention to my question? <laughs> um, I mean, what the hell fixes email, and what is email going to be? What is email going to be in ten years from today? Is it going to be the same thing that we think of it today? No. Where I the think message comes in a stream, and we look. I mean, how many how many emails do you get a day? Uh, probably four or five hundred. And how many do you actually respond to? Uh, a lot of. I mean, anything that's that's a personal one, uh, other than other than spam that happens to be personal, uh, like it's it's a sales rep somewhere emailing me. Backwatering. Right. What is it called? Back? Uh, no, backscattered. No, back that's, 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 no, that's totally different. Yeah. <laughs> so what, what, what's email? Uh, Paint us a picture and tell us the story of what email is going to be in 10 years from today. Um, so, so who knows? Um, but what's interesting... That seems like a pretty shitty story. It's a shitty story. <laughs> the name of my story <laughs> who is who knows? Who knows? <laughs> uh, here's, here's what's really interesting about email right now. So the... Um, the major providers are increasingly opening up their uh, environments for people, for third party application developers to build applications on them. So mm -hmm. if you go into the Gmail app store, there are an awful lot of things that you can plug into your Gmail account to allow it to do different things. So the reason that I can't tell you what the future of email is going to be like in 10 years is that it's probably going to be different for you and for me and for everyone else Got here, it. So you think based on how they want to customize the experience. What do you, what do you make of this whole, I mean, I mean Gmail, just, Gmail just completely cock-blocked a whole industry of businesses that are trying to send messages into people's Gmail. They broke things into folders and they said, here are the people we think you want to talk to, here are the, the business messages you may want to get, and here's all this other shit that we're just going to tell you you don't want, that by the way isn't spam. I mean, A, that must have made your business go up, right, because people must be thinking, hey, how do I get in there? Do you, do you think that's a net benefit for everybody, and is that more the way it's going to go, where it gets going to get even harder and harder to get into somebody's inbox that they look at? You know, I, the data that we have from, uh, from Gmail tabs would suggest that it's actually not having a huge impact if you look at um, open rates, read rates, conversion rates on things. So uh, there's some mailers where their numbers are going down, but there are other ones where their numbers are actually going up. And um, you know, one, of the, one of the good things that you get by foldering everything uh, into a few buckets, which, which Gmail does, is it just actually makes for a better user experience than just the linear stream of stuff that's coming in. So um, our theory about that is that uh, the promotions tab, um, that people actually do go into it once in a while. And when they go into it, they go into it with, with the time and the intent to actually see what's in there. That's interesting. So uh, I don't think it's an inherently bad thing. I think, look, at you know, most humans would say they're scared of change, and that mm -hmm. looks scary, and I get that. But, um, but I don't think it's inherently scary. One of the things that, um, that I think it is going to do, though, uh, is it's going to start to force behavior change uh, on the part of people who send a lot of email. So um, you know, if, if um, uh, if someone goes into that folder with intent to pay attention for a few minutes, um, and they haven't been in there for two weeks, yes. not so good if you have yes. 27 emails in there that all say the same thing. Yes. Um, and we again, coming back to the big data theme, we have the data. Right? You yeah. know whether people are looking at your messages or not looking at your messages with some, some level of, of imprecision, but um, you, know, you shouldn't be continuing to send stuff to Gmail users if they're not opening the last 10 things they got. You're, you're, very, you're very, one of your largest clients. Just get, let's give people a frame of reference. How many emails a day is your largest client sending? So Facebook is a client. I'm guessing, that they, they're, I'm guessing they're the largest emailer on the planet. I don't know how many emails they send a day. Someone at Return Path does. But let's just assume they have a billion users. And how many emails do you get a day from them? Quite a few. Right. So they send quite a few billion emails a day. Wow. Um, so they're probably the biggest. Now, they're an outlier. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, you know, we, have, uh, we have plenty of clients that are in the billion a week uh, category at the so, high end. So I'd love the baseline for some of the folks here. 
Um, I'm sure a lot of people here are starting their own e-commerce business or a business where in some way they're trying to get uh, subscribers or customers and re-engage those. What, would you, what is a kind of standard baseline for an open rate for a follow-up commercial offer? If someone's come to my site and I follow up with a piece of content, if I follow up with a sales offer, what, what's a range, uh, what are the range of open rates? So open rate, not to get too geeky, open rate's a little bit of a flawed metric. Um, there are a lot of things that can trigger an open that aren't really an open, and there are plenty of things that don't trigger an open that are opened. But if you, if you just say, okay, well, it's the metric that's out there. So what are the, what are the things up. that trigger open rates that don't actually make somebody open up an email? Uh, flipping through the preview pane. Um, some it. spam filters actually uh, will fire the pixel uh, if they're actually reading the email. So <clears throat> there are a couple things that, 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 that trigger it falsely. And then anytime images are blocked, uh, and you read it, the pixel doesn't fire. So, oh, that's interesting. Um, yeah. So, the, and, and if you're reading text, or you're reading it offline, or there's lots of lo yeah. lots of things that make it a, kind of a screwy metric. Um, but if you're looking at it over time, at least the trends in it are probably yes. are probably uh, decent to look at. Um, and we track we track something for our clients called read rate, which is actually a much more accurate mm -hmm. metric around it. But setting all that aside, uh, you know, if if you have a 20 or 30 percent read rate or open rate, you're doing great. Um, but all these things kind of depend who you are and what you're sending and, and then, what so kind of engagement your customers have. 20 or 30% open or read rate. Um, once somebody uh, opens your email, what's a really healthy kind of click rate on that email? Um, so totally depends what kind of company you are. I mean, if you're, if, it's, if, it's an, if you're an e commerce company and you're sending offers and you're expecting people to click through and buy, uh, and you're at half a percent that click or a percent that click, you're in pretty good shape. But that's a percent to click of all emails sent. Of all emails sent, yeah. yeah. Um, but just a baseline, that's helpful. Because I yeah. think sometimes people think, oh, I'm going to get this email list of 10,000 people, I'm going to send out this product, and I'm going to get hundreds of orders. Right. Where it would probably be more reasonable to ex expect on a, on a good case scenario, if you sent 10,000 emails, if you got 100 orders from it, yeah. that that would, be a good, that would be a really good response. Yeah, yeah I think that's right. Great. And um, what are, so go, going back into the book, what, what are the other kind of big key pieces of advice that you have for CEOs? What, and when you hand over this manual, if you were to say, hey, I want you to, and someone said, I only got you know, 30 minutes to read the book, what pages do you dog eat ear for them, and what sections do you ask them to read? You're asking me to tell you which one of my children I like the best. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we're actually going to have you read that section right now in front of everybody, <laughs> preferably in an accent. Um, so one of my favorite chapters is around culture, mm -hmm. building culture. And one of my favorite chapters is around creating a, a learning organization. Um, How would you describe the culture of Return too. Path? I would describe our culture as uh, very uh, transparent, um, as very helpful, and as very thankful. That's cool, thankful, I like that. So you said the, the chapter on culture specifically was one of your favorite. What, what, is the, what, is the, what are the points you make about culture that are the most meaningful and important to share with everybody here? Probably the biggest one is that um, you have to be intentional about it. So if you don't steer it, especially in the early days, like the early days is when you're, when you're imprinting the DNA on the organization. And if you don't do that, it'll happen anyway. And you might not be happy with what it is. Uh, so you've got to be really intentional and thoughtful about the kind of place that you want to create, the kind of place you want to work. All right, got it. All right, let's go to questions in the audience. Who's got a question? We got uh, one over here. Let's grab the mic. Uh, when, we, when we come by, uh, please stand up, say the name, say the name of your company. If it's a stupid question, I absolutely reserve the right to ridicule you, but it's okay. Just ask it again. Hi, my name is Phil Hopkins. I'm working with Gadeen, and uh, I really enjoyed your talk so far. I wanted to know what has um, Return Path and the data that you collect taught you about the relative importance of things like lead generation. Um, in other words, you, you, you are amassing all this data. You're learning that, uh, that there are various reasons for, for failure, for success. And uh, what do you think that people are not doing in terms of marketing 
and lead generation and other things that on the front end of a campaign that they could be doing better? On the front end of a campaign? Do you, before they've uh, sent out the, the blast, and, you know, you, you're dealing with the aftermath of, of those attempts, right? Right. So what do you think, that, where is the underspend happening or where is the lack of attention taking uh, place? I think it's, uh, it's probably around segmentation. So the uh, me mentality overwhelmingly uh, among marketers when they use email is to do one thing and send it to everybody. And even if you're emailing a group of prospects that have only had one touch point with you, you know enough about them to not do that. Even if you know just one or two little data points, you know IP geolocation of where they hit your website or the one or two pre-qualifications that you ask them on a form when they download your white paper, you know enough about them to send them things that are a little unique. And that's where most people fall down. And you can, you know, I said a 20% read rate is great. You can have a 50% read rate. Um, you know, there, there's, no, there's no upper bound, I mean, there's an upper, mathematical upper boundary. To you it. must have the absolute best subject lines to your friends and family, because you know every single trick in the book. <laughs> What, literally, can you, share some, can you share some tricks of what people do in subject lines to increase the open rate? What are you seeing folks doing that's working really well? Uh, so how about this? I'll give you an example of uh, something that totally counterintuitive that's not working well. Uh, so, and my hands aren't in the data all day long, so I don't necessarily have all these things on the top of my head, but I, I did see a study we did recently for a client uh, that was really interesting. So, uh, it was for, I think it was for a daily deal site, and I think it was in the UK, but, but we found that the data applied um, universally, that the larger the discount number in the subject line, the lower the open rate and response rate. Does it seem more like bullshit? Right. So 75% off did not do as well as 25% off. Yeah. Yeah. So. I'm going to put more point zero 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 one percent off go. in all right. my emails. <laughs> <laughs> more cocktail chatter for you, along with, with backscatter. Oh, yeah. No, that, one's a, that one's a good one. All right. So I like this. So we're going to stay on this path, and we'll get some more questions. So A, don't put, a don't put too high of a discount rate. What else? What else? Someone once told me, you know who told me this? Greg Sen, who was a client of yours. Was a client of yours, right? Oh, yeah. Yep. yep. So um, at, and he told me back in the day when they put a smiley face at the end of the subject line, they actually got a 10% increase in open rate. And they didn't know why, but through statistical <laughs> significance, and it worked for like three years, and then <laughs> it didn't work anymore. And then they turned it into a frowny face. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then they turned it into a big just F you with a middle finger. <laughs> <laughs> right. So what else? What are some of the other things in the subject line that gets people to open up stuff? Uh, you know, I think the, the having a call to action is, uh, is much better than not having a call to so action. So give an example. So, what, what, what's a good call to action? Um, well, so a Buy bad, my book? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Okay, buy my good. book. Uh, you know, buy my book is probably a better subject line nine times out of ten than, uh, you know, update on my book or I published a book or... Mm -hmm. So tell somebody to do something. Tell somebody to do something. Just be really domineering. <laughs> Treat them as if they're your just like subject, and tell them what to do, and, and thou shalt get a higher open rate. What so else? What are some of the other? I mean, give us the real good juicy stuff, like the stuff that you know, you just the good good juicy stuff that you were not going to tell anybody else. <laughs> the real, real, none of this cocktail chatter, you know, crap. Like the shit that's going to make people a lot more money. You know, they're going to leave here and be like, damn, that subject line is just money. It's printing me money. <laughs> There, you know, there is. Oh, there, come on! Don't hold out on that. <laughs> Don't hold out on us. I know you know it. <laughs> you're the Wizard of Oz when it comes to email. Give us the subject line. You know, you're gonna make me ask ask my colleague Matt for help again in a second. Do so. it, Matt. <laughs> stand up. You, I, I, you're now the OG, Matt. If you tell us this, you're Matt OG. <laughs> what I mean, what what are the other things that people are doing? Does does having people's name in the subject line has that been known to help increase the, that's something I always do because I think it gets people to do it, but I don't know if that's just, I'm making it up in my yeah, head. Yeah, so I don't know. I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Sorry. My hands are not in the data all day. 
Got it. Do you, are there any tricks that you personally have? Like when you write a subject line, I mean, at, literally at this point, you spend so much time in email. Yeah. How do you find yourself crafting subject lines just to kind of get people's attention? Um, I try to have them be relevant to what's in the message. Um, you know, update, not so interesting. Help on a project, more interesting. Um, you know, free tomorrow at noon, most interesting. So I think the more you can actually tie it to what you're trying to say, the better. When you send a message out to the company, you ever start a, the developers are going to laugh, but <laughs> they'll get these subject lines from me at you know, 3 in the morning, important, <laughs> bug, <laughs> fixed by the time I get up. <laughs> Do you have any of those nomenclatures that you use? No. OK. All right, so you're a better person than I am. You're a much better human being. Other questions? I, try to be, question. I, I mean, I try to be asleep at 3 in the morning. But. Well, you're in New York time. You're, you're never asleep. Uh, we got a question over here. And who's got a question after this? We'll get the next mic going. Somebody else, we got a question over here in front. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Kyle, and I'm working at a startup that doesn't have a name yet, but we're hoping associate, so look out for us. Um, Matt, my question is, if you're a recently founded startup, what's the best way to you know, learn about the space and, and get more information? Get out of the building. Uh, one of, I think our, our I, don't know if, I don't know if he coined this term or not, but our head of product management says uh, all the time, nihito, which is nothing interesting happens in the office. So get out of the building. If you're selling to enterprises, like nihito. nihito. If you're selling to enterprises, get out and talk to potential customers. If you're doing a consumer thing, I don't care what you have to do. Get a, grab, get a clipboard, stand in front of Starbucks. Um, but get out of the building. Oh, there are tons of, of free resources that are, that are available uh, to learn things about email. If you go to any, any company in the email space, including ReturnPath, but all the deployment platforms will have a library, an endless library of white papers uh, that you can tap into around that. There have also been a bunch of books written about email marketing. I, a couple of my colleagues and I wrote one um, several years ago, so it's a little bit out of date, although a lot of the fundamentals are still, uh, are still there that's called Sign Me Up. Uh, but there, there are a dozen other books about email marketing you can get and tons of online resources. There's a really good site called Copy Blogger that's just great for how to kind of leverage emails and any copy to help motivate an action too. All right, question over here. Thanks. Um, I'm Chris. I'm actually from uh, the other Silicon Valley up north, so I uh, flew down for this. But uh, I had a question were we, about... Were you and I on the same plane? Uh, yeah, uh, probably, maybe. I don't know. Um, I'm in the north part, though, not Sunnyvale. But uh, so in terms of my question is uh, relating to two things. Number one was uh, kind of tying into what Jason was asking about, um, you know, where the future is. And I know you said you don't really know yet, but when it comes to privacy, Right, and these changes that Google's making and tying all the data that's happening because yeah. we're getting a lot of data through our emails. And then, uh, so kind of if you could talk to where privacy's going and then how working with maybe a company like you can help with that privacy. Uh, and then number two, it was more or less thinking about uh, size of email. So, you know, you see, you've seen a lot of emails that are ridiculous amounts of things and I instantly go, delete. Versus yeah. two sentences, three sentences. Okay, I'll read what you have to say. Yeah, I'll, I'll take them in reverse order. So, uh, so less is definitely more um, when it comes to uh, when it comes to email, um, and, and I, you know it's basic principles of web design too. You don't want a web page with 82 buttons on it. Um, much better off having one or two clear things that the, the content steers you towards. And unless you own buttons.com, uh, and, and then maybe more buttons is better. More is better. More, more is better. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so I, I think generally, look, email uh, email is quick. It's light. People are checking it on phones all the time. Like, there's just only so much you can you can do with it and expect people to pay attention to. So less less is more um, is a real kind of key design principle there. Privacy is a really interesting subject, and I think the I think the world hasn't quite figured out yet what it uh, what it wants when it comes to privacy. The um, uh, it is generally true that younger people, and the, like the younger you get, the less you care about it, sort of the more desensitized you are to it, the more you just assume that it's all public record. Um, so that would suggest that over the long haul, uh, a lot of the things that are lightning rod issues today are going to fade. Um, and look, you know, even the, um, 
you know, even the, the, the whole NSA thing, the Verizon phone records thing, that wasn't news for very long. Um, I don't know that there's going to be lasting damage from that. Um, now, at the same time, um, uh, legislators and regulators are all over this topic. And uh, with you know, a government that can't seem to get out of bed in the morning and tie its own shoes, um, there seems to be enough uh, consternation from the folks back in the district that you know, I think working their way through Washington right now are something like 18 different uh, privacy bills. And some of them uh, are, are potentially quite harmful to any business that, that uses the internet. So it's really hard to figure out where it's all going to shake out. And I think, in, like I said, in the long run, it's probably not going to be as big a deal. But in the short run, there may be a lot of bumps around it. All right, let's, let's take one or two more questions. Hi, I'm Joaquin Beltran and founder of Mentorvine. So you talked about um, Return Path being a learning organization. So I was just curious, what are some of uh, your learning goals and, and how do you go about continuing to learn? Good question. Uh, for me personally or for the company? For yourself. For myself. So um, you know, I would say uh, I have a couple of things that are kind of built into my, my routine or my, my operating system. Um, I read a ton, and I read uh, a bunch of business books, but I also read a bunch of totally not business books. And uh, you know, carving, carving time out for that um, is pretty helpful. Uh, Harvard Business Review sounds really stuffy. Uh, maybe one or two articles a month are great and totally applicable to whatever it is you're doing. Um, so reading is one component of it. Uh, I have always done uh, a huge amount of uh, networking, and some of it's a little random. Um, some of it is very focused and intentional. Um, I have a peer group of CEOs in New York. We get together eight times a year for three or four hours uh, and kind of talk through issues together. Um, I know sort of who the CEOs are at the companies that are in our space that are two steps ahead of where we are and I'm always trying to get in front of them and learn from them. So a lot of kind of that, you know, networking and, and benchmarking is a pretty important part of how I, uh, how I keep, you know, keep learning, keep things fresh. And um, uh, I'm constantly learning from employees as well. You know, I, I have every interaction I have with anyone at the company uh, for the most part includes me asking them, what do I need to know? So, and there's probably other things too, but that's at least a few of them. And you may not know this, but Matt flew down just for this event. He's gonna be turning around, flying back tonight. So really, I wanna thank you so much for coming out here this evening and everything. And sharing your advice. Um, and let's have some drinks, let's turn back up the music and hang out. And everyone, thank you for coming out. We'll see you next month. Thank you. Thank you. This is awesome.